Hey everyone, welcome to the Orange and Black Insider. I am Anthony Cazenza and we are on the precipice of training camp. Uh, after a long a, a long season last year for the Bengals, they, they had just six wins, which came after another uh, terrible ending to the season before that. They now have a chance to rebound, regroup, and they've got a lot of new faces. We're going to be talking about training camp. We're going to be talking about the Bengals starting up that the, all of the festivities that comes with training camp, uh, we'll be talking with that about that this evening. I'm joined by my usual co-host, uh, Scott Schultze. Scott, how are you? I am doing great because not only am I doing a podcast, but I am listening to Peppa Pig in the background. Okay, and what is that? So I'm saying tonight's a pretty good night. Get Bengals and Peppa. So I'm doing very good. Okay, I don't, I don't really know what that is, but. Uh, given that you have a young child, I'm assuming it has something to do with their source of entertainment, correct? Yeah, it is a horribly drawn cartoon, but kind of fun. <laughs> okay, okay. And and by the way, we're going to be talking about, uh, that. that's going to be a theme for, if, if you tuned in last, last episode, we did a question of the night, and that's going to kind of be our theme a little bit tonight, because we have a special guest co-host, Cody Toomey, and for uh, a lot of you that... Follow Cincy Jungle, uh, read read the material there, and uh, are really into the draft. You probably are familiar with Cody Toomey and um, the stuff that he puts out for the draft um, in terms of Bengals stuff and in terms of guys that do a lot of studying. He and Joe Goodberry are two of my favorites personally. So it's good to have you on, Cody. We've worked on other podcasts before. We worked at Cincy Jungle before. Uh, just... Since you're, it's your first time on the program, just briefly tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you are fortunately or unfortunately associated with the Bengals. Well, uh, <clears throat> hey, everybody. Most of you do know me if you follow the draft. Uh, grew up first 25 years in Cincinnati, so, of course, Bengals fan. Everyone remembers the Super Bowl. I was, I think I was eight, somewhere around there, so just old enough to realize why everyone – left our house angry in 89. So um, <clears throat> moved to California, kept my Bengals fan. And obviously that's when I started writing for Cincy Jungle. Um, the last, uh, say, 12 to 18 months of my life have been a little crazy. So haven't been posting as much on Cincy Jungle, but a little time has freed up now that my feet are back under me. So moved from California to Texas. Wife was pregnant, had a baby. He's three months old now and, and transferred positions at my job. So now that things are settled in, hopefully I can get back to you uh, putting some pen to paper, as they used to say. But now it's uh, keystrokes, right? Keystrokes on the Internet. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, no one can blame you for, um, you know, maybe a little lack of content. I think I think everybody, especially the three of us, I know Scott does, too. He's, he has a, a, a young young child at home as well. I've got uh, a bordering on a six-month-old, so... Um, we, uh, have our hands full, obviously with all of that. And I know, uh, I know Scott, you can cor corroborate with, that. I mean, you've got, you've got your, your son's entertainment also playing in the background while, while we're recording, right? Yeah. I'm still waiting for Anthony and, um, Cody now have to bring their son on the podcast. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and one of our early shows, I, I, we made a star. Maybe of, sometime. Yeah. We made a star. We of, ran uh, off to uh, the, went off to the swimming pool today. It's hot here in Texas. I told Anthony it's 106 today. So he's at the pool with his mother. Oh, 106. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> well, because of this, it got, it got us thinking a little bit because Cody was originally from Cincinnati. Obviously he's a Bengals fan at heart, but obviously he covers the draft and all of that as well. But the question we want to pose to everybody tonight, we had a question of the, of the week, last episode and we have another one this episode and it it is does or should cody have the heart to allow his son to be a Bengals fan now obviously this is a Bengals fan podcast i think we all would say of course cody you should however we've all experienced especially those of us in our age group have experienced quite a bit of heartbreak as well and uh, given our love for our children, we probably don't want them to experience some of that heartbreak uh, that we've experienced. So question of the night to the listeners is, should Cody allow his newborn son to be a Bengals fan, especially growing up in Texas, which is Dallas Cowboys country? Scott, what do you think? Should he? 
Yeah, I'd say absolutely. And I'd say several reasons. Uh, I mean, well, the first one, because, you know, dad's a Bengals fan. So the son, obviously, you know, ideally you want the kid to follow in dad's footsteps. Uh, I mean, that's what being parent is, is kind of raising your kids, kind of trying to instill in them the values and whatever. So, yeah, like my, my son, as far as a three-year-old can be a Bengals fan, is a Bengals fan. Uh, and the other good thing is it kind of prevents bandwagoning because at some point when they finally win that elusive playoff game, you know, it's kind of cool to be like, no, I'm, I'm not just wearing this jersey now, you know, this um, this throwback Dalton jersey I'm or whatever it would be, at, you know, when they, whenever they finally win that game. It'd be, hey, I've been, you know, in it with the thick and thin. And, it, you know, it teaches commitment and you ride the ups and downs. But look at Browns <laughs> fans. I mean, if you grew up in the Cleveland area, I mean, those people are so dedicated that when they win, they can truly, truly celebrate it. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, obviously, the pressure will be, you know, be local, but there's something to be said for being, you know, kind of the outsider, um, the one that kind of has a reason for rooting for that team and not just because, you know, it's the Cowboys or Patriots or, you know, a, a popular team that's the trendy pick. So, yeah, I'd say def- 100 percent, definitely. I, yeah, I wouldn't say 100 percent, probably, but, uh, you know, I understand the reasoning. Greg L. in the YouTube chat already says yes with a couple of exclamation points that you should be doing that. Let us know. Sound off uh, in the YouTube chat as well as the live comment stream that we have going at Cincy Jungle. Uh, every week this show is live on both of those platforms and uh, not only can you send us questions, which we will be trying to take at the end of this program, but you can interact with other Bengals fans, kind of talk about uh, what's going on with the team, and, and and join us in our discussion. That's that's what this show is about. We want to make it interactive, and we are grateful for all of the live viewers and all of the feedback we get. Guys, now that we've maybe established what Cody should be teaching his son, the Cincinnati Bengals have released their top 50 players in franchise history, and obviously this coincides with the the fact that the team has 50 years of history or they're, they're in their 50th year. Uh, I understand some people have some confusion that it says 1968 to 2017, but you, you got to count both of those years, and there's 50 total years uh, for all of you math majors out there. But there's some su- surprises. There was some disappointments guys that were placed in the countdown that were very surprising. And if you have not checked this out, all of the information on this is not only on Cincy Jungle, but it's on bangles.com along with some great videos breaking down all of the players via Dave Lapham and Dan Horde on bangles.com. So check those out. Pretty cool how they count down all the players. I was a little disappointed on some. Scott, you wrote a post on Cincy Jungle discussing some of the snubs, some of the players that maybe were ranked a little lower than uh, what a lot of people thought. And again, this was both a fan and media-based uh, voting system, from what I understand. So, give us some of yours that you that you talked about in your in your Cincy Jungle post. Yeah, and that, that's one of the nice things about being a writer for Cincy Jungle is when you want to grumble about something, you have a platform to do that other than spouses and coworkers and three year <laughs> so, Yeah, and, and you know, you don't, I mean, you, you don't always have to toe the company line, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what, what your content has to say all the time. You know what I yeah. mean? In terms of <clears throat> kissing up, kissing up to the bangles, you know? Yeah, I mean, if the Bengals don't have media badges to worry about them taking away. (laughs) Yeah, if the Bengals were to offer me Hobson's job, I would not turn it down. But at the same time, since I don't have that job, it it does, like you said, it gives us a little more flexibility to voice our opinion, right or wrong. But yeah, not necessarily party line. That being said, the first 50, there were several um, position i guess people who were added who were omitted and then also the order of some of the people that to me kind of struck me as kind of odd or just incorrect and you kind of see this when you when they do the selection committee for the NCAA basketball they vote you know who people you like to grumble and moan oh who is this guy was left out i can't believe they left you know this team out or put this team in and this team's a two seat you know what the heck and top 25 lists you see that and so i thought it's kind of the same thing it's a fifth top 50 list basically so Let's look at the top 50 list and see, are there some things that just kind of make no sense, that just kind of make you wonder, what in the heck were these people thinking when they 
made their selections. So there's essentially six, and I'm sure there's more or less depending on who you ask. There were six that they came up with that seemed to be the most, uh, I guess, egregious. So I'll just kind of run down them, explain why I listed them, and then I'll just kind of turn it over, um, see if you guys see what you guys think of those or have any additional ones. So the first two are kickers. First one is Shane Graham being left off the list altogether in favor of Doug Pelfrey. That was one that surprised me right away because not only has Graham have more career kicks, he has a much higher field goal. I think he has the Bengals all-time record in field goal accuracy for a career. So like 87%, Pelfrey is only 77%. He So Graham made more kicks, was more accurate. They played the same amount of time. So, you know, head-to-head, there's really no reason Graham – should be below Pelfrey, let alone all off the list altogether. So that one just struck me as kind of odd. The other one that really baffled me, so I had to dig into this next one a little deeper, and it still baffles me, was Jim Breach in the top five. Now, I'm a, like most everyone who followed the Bengals, um, you know, for more than 10, 15 years who remembers him, he always seemed to be a fan favorite, was a great guy, um, seen him at local things. Uh, you know, this seems like a, a good person, a team person. People really like him. Played a ton of games, uh, has the most points in Bengals history. So I get those longevity things, but at the same time, he was never a great kicker. He's a career 70% kicker, never made a Pro Bowl, never made an All Pro. So basically, what the voters are saying that the fifth best player ever in this 50 years of the Bengals history is a guy that was never even good enough to be in a Pro Bowl. So to me, that's kind of struck me as a very odd decision. The third one, yeah. and I expect this one to get some grief was uh, Icky Woods, where I just think he's rated too high. I mean, I, I loved the shuffle as a kid. <laughs> I like the guy cook commercial, you know, going to get me some cold cuts. Uh, but putting him ahead of Pete Johnson was one that just kind of uh, really baffled me. I think Pete Johnson has the team uh, franchise record for most career rushing touchdowns. He's like 64 or something like that. So to me, this just screams people don't remember who Pete Johnson is. And they remember Icky Woods because of the dance and the commercial. And I don't think it was really based on anything other than just kind of popularity. Because Woods is a, you know, I mean, he, he was a, a flash in the pan. He was a one year. I mean, he had a great one year, but essentially that was his whole career. And to me, that just, I don't know, that doesn't seem sufficient to be put ahead of a guy who had a long Bengals career, you know, had a 6,000 more total yards, you know, 50 more touchdowns. And then the other, uh, the next two I had are linemen. One was Dave Lapham uh, being ranked 18th. And the reason I mentioned this is if you look at uh, profootballreference.com, they have what they call some approximate value or AV ranking. And it was very interesting that every offensive lineman they ranked basically followed that approximate value ranking from Rich Bram, Joe Walter, Kazerski, Bob Johnson, Willie Anderson. One exception was Dave Lapham, who really – you know, based on that, probably shouldn't have been in the top 50, but made it all the way to 16. So I, my personal thought is a lot of that has to do is because he is a media person. People know the name. He was a good player. I don't know if he was necessarily a top 25 or top 15 guy. I don't think the numbers really support that. But people know him. People listen to him on the radio. They love hearing him on the radio. So I'm, I'm assuming that's just like with Icky Woods. He got in more for recognition than anything he's done. The other one was Willie Anderson below Max Montoya, which just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Maybe it's because I saw Willie Anderson play. Like he was, he should be a Hall of Famer. Or yeah, he, Willie Anderson should be a Hall of Famer. He has All Pro selections. Montoya does not. He has uh, more Pro Bowl <coughs> selections. He's played more games. It's all around. Dude, the, and he played a more important position. If you figure tackle is a more important than guard. So that one was another one. Finally, the very last one, and this is the one I voted for. So of all these, the one that. I guess rubbed me the wrong way the most would be Greg Cook making the list and finishing ahead of Jeff Blake. And I know people who are local to say they love Jeff or Greg Cook. He was a, you know, this huge potential, you know, guy went to UC local area guy and everything. But at the end of the day, he only played 12 games in his NFL and Bengals career. And somehow to say, you know, one of your 50 best players only played less than a season. Uh, ex- you know, especially when someone like Jeff Blake, basically carried that offensive passing game for, you know, how many years with, uh, you know, the deep bombs to Carl Pickens. And, you know, after years of having guys like uh, David Klingler and Akili Smith, okay, now we finally have this guy who seems to know how to throw football. And we aren't giving him any blocking. We aren't really doing much on defense. But, hey, this guy made a Pro Bowl. But, yeah, we're still going to vote for this guy who played 12 games over him. 
So I tried to run through it kind of quick, but those are the six that I thought were the most confusing. And to me, the, the, the worst one was picking a guy that played a handful of games as a top 50. Now, potential, I, I totally get the Greg Cook thing, but just over the their longevity, their career, looking at what they accomplished, looking at the production, which a lot of these votes – especially guys like Jim Breach. You can tell it's they, they're they definitely looking at total numbers and production. So, you know, a guy that plays 10, 12 games just made no sense. So, anyway, that's that's my Yeah, point. hard to argue with a lot of those. And for those of you who have not seen that post on Cincy Jungle, go there and you can uh, – it's still up there, and I believe the poll is still open. Pretty entertaining stuff. Uh, I, you know, for me, there's a couple in there where, you know, one, one I may disagree with you a little bit and not so much that he should be ahead of her. The Willie Anderson, Max Montoya thing. That, that to me, I, 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 a lot of people don't remember Max Montoya. He was an excellent guard, but he was, you know, aided on line by a lot of other good players as well. Willie Anderson, I do, I do think, does deserve some Hall of Fame uh consideration unfortunately he played you know 96 through 2002 on some terrible Bengal teams and got overlooked for the Pro Bowl and finally got the recognition he deserved once the Bengals started winning with Marvin Lewis there before I get to you Cody on some of yours um in terms of surprises and whatnot uh, I agree that Dave Lapham I think he should be on there I don't think he should be number 18 that's that's Far too high, Dave. Dave, let for, for reference, and this is this is one that really stuck in my craw. For reference, Dave Lapham ranked eight places higher than Carl Pickens, and Carl Pickens was another guy who was on a bunch of terrible teams, and he came in at number twenty six. That was kind of staggering to me. And the only three names ahead of him in terms of yards as career yards with the team, Isaac Curtis, AJ Green, and Chad Johnson. Okay. You go to touchdowns. Chad Johnson's the only guy in front of him with receiving touchdowns. He's ahead of Isaac Curtis and he's ahead of currently of AJ Green. Um, you know, I, to me, I, I'm not saying he should necessarily be top 10, but I think putting him in the mid twenties to me was was kind of egregious. I think Corey Dillon could have been bumped up a little bit. I think he was at number fifteen. Um, there were guys I kind of made my own little top ten. There were guys that were in that uh, the, in the teens that I was shocked. You know, Willie Anderson and Max Montoya and guys like that. I was I was a little shocked. I thought Boomer Esiason was a little low. Um, that 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 kind of shocked me as well. Uh, but those are those are you know again this is kind of a Totally subjective thing, and uh, some guys get a little bit. I think Chris Collinsworth was ranked very high as well, if I remember correctly. Uh, another guy that I, you know, good player. I don't, I don't know that he was necessarily better than a guy like Carl Pickens. He was just on more successful teams and played on two Super Bowl teams. So, you know, obviously the the better teams and some of these guys that maybe were in that uh, that early part of Marvin Lewis's reign when when players were playing a little better uh, that kind of stuck out to a lot of the voters minds Cody your thoughts on some of the guys uh on on the Bengals 50 and maybe I mean we're being kind of negative here maybe if you have any thoughts on where they got it right uh you know I'd like to hear that too yeah I mean I think you guys touched on a lot of them I think Willie and Anderson it'd be a guy I think is criminally too low just because of you know where he he did play for such an awful team you have to think like the guys around him he was I mean, he had Reggie Kelly to one side, so at least he had a pretty decent blocking tied in on one side, but you know, the rest of the offensive line wasn't much to to write home about. So he's going solo on a lot. And I, I would say I would put him in my top ten. Um, I agree with you. I think Collinsworth, I mean, I think a lot of this list has to be it's all about the like it's not who you are, it's who you know, you know. I think a lot of this list is is swayed by media opinion, the fact that Collinsworth and Boomer are still in the media. They're obviously going to be – when I saw Willie Anderson was 14th, I immediately quote, t- quote tweeted that and said, watch, Collinsworth and Boomer are going to be ahead of him. And, you know, you knew they were going to be on the list, and the fact is, like, you know, are, are they better than him? I mean, but the thing is, like, when you're talking about 14 versus, you know, maybe 9 or 10, is it really that big a difference? But um, – People forget, you know, Boomer had a uh, an MVP season, 
took them to a Super Bowl. Uh, you know, in the Super Bowl, their best defensive player goes down, and Boomer pretty much. I mean, if you've seen the uh, Missing Rings by America's game with them, where he's like, I mean, there were basically people there putting makeup on me to get me ready to say I'm going to Disneyland or Disney World or whatever, and then all of a sudden they just yep. run across the field and go to Joe Montana, and I just realized, like, it's over, you know? Uh, so those are some guys I think I – mean, and Corey Dillon, I think, is – and I think it's a lot to have to do with his – the way he left the team, the way Carl Pickens left this team – there's for sure that Mike Brown is one guy that holds grudges and doesn't bury the hatchet. He's gotten better at that. I mean, Sam Weish is a perfect example. The dude was so influential in the Bengals' history, right? I mean, this team, let's be honest, the team hasn't won a playoff game in over half of its current existence. It has been – this is a 50-year football team, and it's been 26 years since they won a playoff game. One of the last coaches to take them to a playoff win is hasn't even been welcomed back to this team. Like, can't tell me that there's not some bad blood that's causing that. And I think a lot of this list, uh, Jim Breach, I agree with you. He's probably higher than that, but I'll I'll say one thing and tell you why he's top five, 19 to 16. He kicks that field goal and takes the lead in the Super Bowl with 39 seconds left. That's what everyone remembers, and that was probably one of the clutch kicks in Bengals history and you can I'll tell you what I'll take <clears throat> and it's 78 percent kicker that makes 99 percent of them when they count all day long because what was wrong with Mike Nugent he made a lot of kicks and he missed ones when we really needed him to make them uh same with Shane Graham Shane Graham probably didn't make the list because he had a yellow Hummer um <laughs> That's a true story. He has a yellow Hummer. Uh, I used to work I at remember. Uh, Trop- Shout out to Jeff Ruby's Tropicana. Uh, he drove a yellow Hummer. He would always drive them there like a sucker. And Justin Smith and all those guys would put all their drinks on his tab and then make him drive them <laughs> home. <laughs> so That's shout great. out to Shane Graham if you're listening to this. Thanks for getting those guys home safe back in the day when <laughs> none of them were getting home safe. Chad Johnson – didn't ever drink there. He hid in the corner and drank cranberry juice. But anyways, I got that. As I digress, uh, I agree with you. I think a lot of it, Carl Pickens, Corey Dillon, some of those guys that left on ugly terms is why they are ranked when they are. I wouldn't be surprised if, like, they had already mapped out the top 50 and then, like, Mike Brown, like, snuck in there late at night and moved him down, like, five or six people. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, you got to – <laughs> Move them down. Know, it, it was good. top 10. Yeah, it was good to see. I think Chad was, I think he was top, I think he was number four, uh, if, I, yeah. if I remember correctly. Uh, it was, it he was, was top, top six or something. Yeah, yeah. He was, yeah. He, was he was very high. And it was, he was always the guy that wasn't, I mean, he wasn't on the level of Dylan and, uh, and Pickens in terms of being at odds with management, but it was still very good to see him that high. And, and deservedly so. Obviously, one of the best players in in franchise history. And obviously, if you don't know who number one is, if you haven't seen the list, then you don't really know who you don't know your Bengals because it's obviously Anthony Munoz is the best player to ever wear a Bengals uniform and and a great great guy at all. Scott, any additional thoughts since you put this? You, you kind of came up with this post for Cincy Jungle. I thought it was I thought it was very well done. Just a couple. The first one you mentioned, Chad Johnson. I'm, but I can't find Chad Ocho Cinco anywhere. <laughs> well, and you're not gonna. Uh, you're not gonna. And, you know, I, I know he still goes. I know he still goes by it personally. I I never call him that. I I, like, I, I think I they should have a that. ranking for each. Like maybe put Chad Johnson, you know, based on his career numbers at like twelve, and then Chad Ocho at like twenty or something. <laughs> Get two average him, average him out or something. Yeah, yeah. The air one hey, I his have. his worst mistake ever was when he did the touchdown celebration with the Hall of Fame jacket. Uh, that might yeah. cost him getting in the Hall of Fame because that did not set well with Hall of Fame people, and then his career really fell off quickly after that. So he doesn't have, like, the gaudy stats just to lock himself in. Yeah. Might be the only Hall of Fame jacket he ever throws on. Although I guess he could argue he's a two-position player since he also kicked. He did kick. <laughs> yeah. He did kick. That's right. That's right. Well, I'll just throw out one final thing on this. Yeah. Uh, if anyone hasn't been to it yet, uh, 
I'll go ahead and throw a link to it in the YouTube um, question section, and it's still posted on Cincy Jungle. Uh, there is voting on there. I'll just mention kind of how the voting of all the ones we mentioned finished. Uh, just real quick, I'll just mention the top, not all of them. The one that finished second place with 25% was Greg Cook making the list and finishing ahead of Blake. And the one that finished in first place, basically what, what did fans consider the most absurd ranking with over a third of the vote, it was Jim Breach ranked fifth overall. So I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, and I think I think that one is, uh, you know, I, I, that one's flawed. But I, I also think longevity and uh, him kicking I, in both Super Bowls, you know, being, being a kicker in both of those years, I think, uh, played into his corner there. What do you think, listeners, are the biggest snubs? Where did the Bengals get it right in terms of the top 50? There were, I mean... If you're talking who should be on the list, I mean, I think quite a few people should be on the list. We're talking about some kickers and whatnot that that didn't make it. Um, but, for, I mean, for the most part, all of the big names are there. It's I think it's more of an ordering type of thing that uh, a lot of people have qualms with. But let us know. Let us know in the YouTube chat. Let us know in the live Cincy Jungle thread that we have going. And if you're unable to join us live, if you're catching this and downloading it later, you can catch the show on YouTube, on iTunes, on SoundCloud, at Cincy Jungle. You can get in touch with us on Twitter, at Bengals OBI. You can get in touch with us. Send us your questions as well, at theobinsider at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And, uh, yeah, just, just get in touch with us. We love hearing from you. Last week we had somebody from the Bahamas talk to us. We had, uh, I, I've been in touch with people from the UK, which is really cool. So uh, thanks for listening. And yeah, we, we, we love, we love our listeners and we'll be taking some more questions later in the show. So uh, please shoot some of those in the YouTube chat. If you are listening live and or the Cincy jungle comment thread guys, guys, it's training camp. It's, it's here. Uh, it seems like, at least for me, it seems like since that wild card game of 2015, and and really, even though the Bengals won a couple of games in 2016, they were like, okay, we're competitive. It really seems that everything has kind of been blah and a little slow motion. At least for me, I could I could be alone on an island, but just from that point on, it's been a little blah. And I think a lot of fans are. You know they're hopeful, but I think they're also still reeling from that. A year, the the big loss against Pittsburgh a year and a half ago. Excitement levels really high now, though. Not only just because it's training camp, but because the Bengals have they've added a bunch of new offensive talent in in this year's draft, and they have gotten younger, they've gotten faster, they've kind of shed some dead weight that a lot of people perceived was on the team last year. So that should help things. As we talk <clears throat> about training camp, Scott, we, we've talked about some potential breakout players, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But what is – since positivity is is a little higher than it's been over the – since uh, especially over last year, what is your – what is it you're looking forward to most to seeing this training camp and maybe even to preseason? Yeah, I'd say for me, one of the biggest things I'm looking forward to as far as training camp, and I, I hope this is positive, it may not sound positive, is I just want to see John Ross stay off the pup list and actually play or do something in training camp. Because the last couple of years, we've had a really bad track record of drafting guys that don't, uh, first round picks who don't play in training camp and preseason. So you figure last year it was William Jackson who got injured and missed the whole entire year. The year before we drafted a boy, he who was hurt when we drafted him. So he didn't play. So you have to go all the way back to 2014 to Darquez Denard to find a guy who actually was healthy enough to play. And then even then he didn't start. So you'd have to go back to Tyler Reifert to find a guy who actually played a little bit and contributed. So you're going back quite a ways to find anyone who actually was playing. So, <laughs> To me, that's one of the biggest things I want to see in training camp. So I just want to see John Ross not start the year on the pup list, you know, actually get in there at some point during training camp, play in a preseason game. And the biggest thing I'm looking for as far as pre or preseason games would be Joe Mixon. I mean, it's, it's one and Carl Lawson. And I guess it's two things. 
uh, because it's one thing to see them, you know, the OTAs to see what they can do when there's no contact. But I, I want to see what these guys do against real competition. I want to see is Lawson really as dominant as he looked in the OTAs as everyone was raving. And if he is, you know, why'd this guy fall the fourth round? If he's really that good of a pass rusher as we seem to think he is. And the same thing with uh, Joe Mixon. I mean, Anthony I, and I have both, um, you know, waxed eloquently about Joe Mixon, how great it was the Bengals should draft him. And then when they drafted him, how great it was they drafted him. So I'd like to see, you know, that come to fruition. Let's, so I'm looking forward to him actually playing against some NFL caliber defenses and, you know, in preseason. And I, I assume he'll get a lot of playing time in the first couple of weeks. And I want to see what, what this guy does. And it may not be against starters, but I just want to see what this guy does against NFL teams. So I guess for me, those are the biggest training camp things I'm looking forward to. Yeah, and a couple of news and notes. I guess I should have started this segment off with that. Uh, so shame on me, slap on the wrist. But uh, a bunch of – there was an announcement on Wednesday. Now, this doesn't mean things can change, but the Bengals have placed rookie running back Jarvion Williams and safety Brandon Wilson on the active non-football injury list uh, to start camp. John Ross was not put on – any kind of NFI list that could change. Marvin Lewis did say a, a day, a couple of days ago that, you know, we could see him in the preseason. He's obviously got an off season shoulder injury. He's nursing at the moment, but uh, you know, he, he seems to be available. Tyler Eifert seems to be available. There are reports that Giovanni Bernard could be available at the beginning of camp. So, uh, just some news and notes, and and this obviously could affect your answer here, Cody. Uh, what what might you be looking? Uh, what are you looking forward to the most as training camp opens up for the Bengals in this pretty pretty new look team compared to last year? Yeah, I think for me, uh, the two main position battles that I care about, and I'll kind of touch a little bit on what Scott was talking about. I think the real concern with Lawson uh, is he's had a a nagging hip injury and NFL teams just freak out about the hips. Uh, obviously Dennis Pitta uh, is a good example of what happens when they go bad. Um, and <clears throat> it's just a chronic thing. And I think that's what caused him. But you take one look at Carl Lawson and you're like, I do not want to face him. Uh, he is, he's is a massive ripped quick individual. Um, he's a little bit stiff because he is so big. Um, and I think that's probably a little bit of contribute to why he, he fell as well. But it's mostly injuries, I'd say, on his part. I'm surprised he made it to where he did. But I think teams have just shied away from injuries with this draft class that was loaded with edge rushers and potential guys. Um, for me, I think it goes right to their defensive line, That how that line shakes out. I mean, I was really happy to see that they let Pecco – uh, you know, move on and nothing against Pecco. Thank you for your services. He has been a big piece of this defense over the last decade or so, but I think it was time to move on and Billing should take his role uh, as well as you've got um, <clears throat> the battle between, you know, is it Brandon Tompkins, is it Pat Sims? I'd say one of those two gets cut. I'd like to see Deshaun Williams get some get some snaps. So a lot of the battles there on the interior defensive line, I think, can really. I'd like to see this team follow the same movement that they made in the in the draft, in the sense of, hey, look, let's get younger, let's get more athletic, let's get faster. I want to see them continue that trend and <clears throat> shed the whole. We need to keep these veterans around in the locker room. Andy Dalton, AJ Green should be enough of your veterans on offense. Uh, regardless if you like it or not, you've got, uh, you know, Vontez Perfect and Pac-Man on defense. Um, whether or not we want to admit it, uh, based on what the players talk about, they're leaders in that locker room. So <clears throat> you have veteran leadership. So let me see you move forward and go ahead and just do those uh, offensive lines. Stay younger, get those quicker, younger players in, and – it's a young man's game, especially on defense. So I think that's something I want to see is see them move forward with the offensive or defensive line and keep some of those younger bodies in that. Uh, same way with the secondary. Uh, Kavari Russell is a good player. I think he's an athletic player. I don't want to mm -hmm. see them cut him. 
Uh, obviously, whatever happened in Kansas City happened, but um, <clears throat> I, I think he's a good player. So I want to see how the secondary shakes out. So I'd like to see some you know, contact drills between those guys and, and some one-on-ones with the receivers and the secondary so they can get uh, and just kind of see how they shake out the roster. They're probably going to go two quarterbacks, right? But I think one of the funny things with training camp, speaking of you know videos and what have you, is watching a guy beat the guy who's going to get cut three weeks later um, yeah, and yeah. then everyone decide that he's the greatest guy that we need to keep him and he needs to get, you know, the uh, – his name, Touchdown Jesus. What What's his real name? Uh, the guy from Wisconsin Whitewater that everyone's in, uh, oh, Jay Coomer, in love with. Oh, Jay Kumaro. Jay Kumaro, right? Kumaro should be getting like 30 snaps a game based on Twitter because he <laughs> catches like three touchdowns in training camp. But uh, I'm excited to see some of the battles at different positions, uh, especially the young draft picks on the defensive line. Um, I think that's important, especially Billings and William Jackson that we didn't get to see last year. Uh, Essentially, you've got 13 new players coming in from this draft class. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Bengals try to pull a little bit of A.J. McCarron craftiness with some of these guys that have some nagging injuries coming in and – or the NFL P or NFL I list <clears throat> so they can stash them uh, and not lose them if they cut them and go try to get them on the practice squad. Cause I think some of those late picks that you, if you don't, if you don't keep those players, that's a, that's a poor draft on their part and you've wasted draft equity. If you up with that pick or traded that pick to another team for next year's future pick, if you take a six round pick and trade up for them and then cut them, and then someone else takes them, right? I mean, that's not good use of draft. If you're going to keep 11 draft picks, you better keep 11 players or 10. Right, right. And and just real quick, we're kind of running up a, a little bit against uh, some time constraints. But since you are a draft guy, Cody, uh, we did ask Joe Goodberry when he was on the program a while back his thoughts on the draft class. While that is a couple of months now in the rear view, can you just give us a minute or two about what you think about this year's draft class and who you think the stars are? I mean, obviously John Ross and Joe Mixon headline it. Uh, you you talked about Carl Lawson, and, and I think it was James Napke in the YouTube chat who was talking about Carl Lawson as well. But just real quickly, your, your thoughts on this year's class. I thought it was pretty well-rounded, and I think the Bengals got younger and faster, which they desperately needed. Scott agrees. What do you think? Yeah, I think some guys at late late rounds that you might not be surprised or you might be surprised presently uh, with is like a guy like Jordan Evans. Uh, I think he's exactly what they've needed at linebacker. He's a quick guy that can cover. He's not so much a run stuffer, but I mean he'll 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 tackle when needed. But he's a fast guy that can cover at linebacker. In the new NFL, you need a quote unquote eraser linebacker. So I think that was a really good pick for them. I didn't really know much about him going in and, and did some post-draft review on him and really like what I saw with him as far as his uh, abilities there. Joe Mixon was, I mean, had he not had, and, and let's not, let's not sugarcoat it. It was a bad incident, right? Had that had not happened, he goes top 10 guaranteed. I mean, he's a lock. Uh, he's just as good as Fournette, maybe better because of his hands. I mean, the guy can catch as well as most receivers. So uh, like Scott said, he's a guy you're really going to want to see, and, and how do you get rid of the, the stigma that you've drafted this guy with this horrible baggage, right? Ask, ask the Kansas City Chiefs. You put the guy on the field, you let him make some magic, and then the signs go from, hey, you know, woman beater or whatever the signs were early in the season to tie free kill, score some touchdowns, right? So right. unfortunately, a lot of times the fans have a pretty short memory when it comes to a guy that starts lighting up the scoreboard. So if you're going to take a risk on a guy like that, put him on the field, let his – let his fields speak for him and start to put some of that baggage in his rearview mirror. Um, I think I think those are I think Jordan Evans is a guy that'll really surprise people. I think Willis is a guy that'll really take over for I think Dunlap is gone. Let's be real. He's gone after next season. You see the contract that uh, uh, Griffin got today. I mean that's gonna be a starting point for Dunlap. That's more than Mike Brown's gonna want to pay and Carlos Dunlap's not going to take any less. So I think Willis fits right into his role in two years and gives him some time to develop behind him. 
And I actually, if this if if this if this season falls off the rails, I'd be trading Carlos Dunlap. There's a bold prediction. I do it. I mean, if you know you're just gonna leave next year and you're not gonna make him a competitive offer mm. like Zeitler, why wouldn't you move him when he has good value? When you know, at the at best, you have him for next year, but at least you can see what you have in front of him. Maybe you pull a first round pick that you can get a top flight offensive or defensive lineman to replace what you lose in him. And you know, Cody Toomey, our uh, his first stint on our on our show, listens to our program when he's throwing out a bold prediction. So I, I appreciate that, and that would be bold if this season not only does get off the rails, but if the Bengals end up dealing Carlos Dunlap. I will be brief with what I'm looking forward to in training camp. I will say I'm looking forward to seeing seeing the stars back. Uh, you know, we talked about. I just mentioned. It seems as if Ross will be available at some point in training camp. Maybe not immediately. Uh, Same with Eifert. Giovanni Bernard appears to be coming back. A.J. Green is healthy from the hamstring injury. And you got those guys back. And as you watched the Bengals at the end of last season, that offense was stagnant. That offense had very little big play capability. Obviously, now you had Ross. You had Mixon. Uh, you, that that helps, but you get your stars back, and you get you get these guys back. Maybe they're not going to be in full pads right away. Maybe they may not play in two or three of the preseason games, but they will be back. And it seems, barring any kind of setbacks, that they will be ready for Week One, and this team hopefully will be full go and can hopefully <laughs> avoid extra injuries. There, I will say one other thing. I'm looking forward to. You guys kind of touched on it a little bit. The, uh, with Adam Jones now getting suspended for the first game of the year, the spotlight is brighter on William Jackson the third and on Darquez Denard. And it seems as if that to start opposite of Drake Kirkpatrick in week one, it's going to come down to one of those two guys. I still think Darquez Denard is a better slot NFL corner. You don't want to hear that when you talk about a first round NFL corner, but I just the think. Truth. I think I think it, I think that's what it is, and William Jackson the third is a better boundary outside corner. Now I think there are a couple other guys that could vie for time and maybe rotate in on that week one uh, situation. Josh Shaw could be a guy they mix in and out. Uh, you know there there are a couple of other guys. Kavari Russell may may stick on the ros- roster, and though he'd probably be a, primarily a special teams guy, he could be a, a, you know a boundary player as well. But I think corners especially with what's going to ensue barring a successful appeal by adam jones i think that's something i'm looking forward to as well you guys kind of mentioned william jackson there but we'd like to hear what you all are looking forward to most about training camp maybe it's just the start of some something resembling some real football and Mm -hmm. uh and something that resembles uh a, a hopefully a hopeful turnaround season by the Bengals after uh, really a, a tough year, year and a half of of between Andy Dalton's injury, the wild card loss last year, uh, just a, just a really tough year and a half for this club. Hopefully, they get things on the right track and stay healthy. Let's be quick with this, and we'll try to get to a listener question or two at the end if we have some time. Please leave those in the YouTube chat. Please leave those at in the Cincy Jungle comment thread. We are looking for some. We'll try to get to a couple. Scott, we, you and I over the past couple of weeks have been doing some Bengals potential breakout players. We've talked about Andrew Billings. We've talked about, uh, you know, I, I think Jake Fisher was one last week. Uh, you, talked, you talked about a couple of others as well. Give me another that you're thinking of, especially now that we're getting real close to training camp. What was that a what specifically were you looking for? Potential breakout player. Okay, on that I'm gonna I guess off the top of my head I'm going to did, did we say Jake Elliott? No, no, we said Jake okay, Fisher. I'm gonna go Jake Elliott. Okay. Okay, I heard a Jake. I'm gonna go Jake Elliott because I'm sorry, my I was. Uh, yeah, you got you got listening. you got your program in the background. I I get you, my friend. I got I know where your priorities are. <laughs> That being so, that being said, I'm, I'm going to go Jake Elliott for several reasons. One, uh, this is a team that 
I think is going to be more improved from last year. So I think he's going to get a lot of chance to move the ball. Um, in one of the posts I did last year about fantasy football, I had looked at kickers. And one very interesting thing is there's a strong correlation between how many yards an offense generates and how well your fantasy kickers perform. And I think that for whatever reason, if you go back to the last decade, that's just what it is. And I think this is a team that could have an improved offense from last year. They have a lot more weapons. So I think their kickers are going to have a lot of chance to make kicks, not just extra points, but a lot of field goals. And so he's a guy who I think is going to win the job. He's a guy who has been pretty good from distance. If you take out his sophomore year, uh, when he was a young little, you know, 18 year old or whatever, he's been a very good kicker, very good from long, very good from, you know, never missed anything inside of 30 yards. He's someone who I think could come out of nowhere and possibly have a great season. Now, I don't want to say he's, you know, the next Justin Tucker or anything right away, but I, I think he has a chance to surprise a lot of people, especially if he, you know, ends up, uh, winning the job, which I assume he's going to win. I can't imagine them using a fifth round pick and making him the top kicker to cut him. Um, Even, I mean, he'd have to do as as bad as that Roberto Aguayo would to possibly be cut. So I think he's going to start. And I think he could surprise some people, especially if his offense does anything like they did two years ago. So there's my breakout guy. So rookie kicker. Okay. And, and, you know, I, I get it. I get it. Uh, yeah, that's a position. It's we can talk about running back. We can talk about offensive line. We can talk about that. That was a mess last year. That position. That was a mess. And if they can get a decent amount of improvement, be it on extra points or field goals, if they can get a decent amount of improvement from somebody, whether it's Jake Elliott or Randy Bullock or whoever, that I mean. Mike Nugent cost them wins last year, and you, I, I, we've talked about this on the program. You don't want to point right at one guy, especially the kicker, for that. But there were – it made a difference in terms of the win-loss column. So, Or the tie column, uh, if you're talking about the Bengals last year. So, Cody, in, in case you missed uh, kind of what we're talking about with the potential b- breakout players, it doesn't have to be a rookie. It could be. It could be a young player who maybe is stepping into a new role and might might start, might be a more heavy rotator in, uh, maybe someone who flashed a little bit the year prior and now is poised for some sort of different or more significant role. Who are Who is a potential breakout player for you as the Bengals are getting close to kickoff training camp? Um, Russell Bodine. Just kidding. Anyone who oh, follows me yeah, knows that's yeah. a joke. <laughs> yeah, uh, to. I'm gonna go. With, hey, I'm gonna go with Sean Williams. Okay. Uh, first year as a full starter last year. Uh, I feel like a lot of times last year he not look he looked out of position, but a lot of times it looked like he was going for the big hit, and uh, it, and it cost him uh, being out of position a bit. And I think this is a big year for him. And I think if he can play better, then Iloka can go back to his role of just honing the middle and getting a little bit more interceptions for Iloka, which can help flip the field for them. So I think if uh, I think Sean Williams is a guy that I think can have a good year. Um, he's got a full year under his belt in that in that role now with his new contract. Less less of it eyeballs on him, right? Where he's just like oh, I got this new deal, I have to live up to it, right? And I think he's kind of been uh, – we go back to that playoff hangover, right? He had a really costly penalty that was not a penalty yep. in that game. I remember, yep. He lit him up over the middle, and I feel like he's played a little different since then. And, you know, they didn't find him or anything, but I feel like that's kind of hangover from that game is he's gone for the big shot, but he's also – um being really cautious of, of where he shoots his shots. So he's missed some – I think he's missed some tackles and missed some big hits because he's worried about getting fined or penalized. So uh, Sean Williams, that's the breakout guy for me. And you know what? That's that's fair. You know, a lot of people think, well, maybe he broke out last year because he was a full-time starter, signed that signed a decent contract. But you know what? I, I agree with you on that. And we talk – we talked about this on the, the program a few weeks ago. We had a listener question ask us about Sean Williams and if he's worth the contract, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I I agree with you. There were some there were some issues early last season with, with some coverage and things like that, but he got better as the year went on. 
And if you noticed when he stepped in a couple of times for Reggie Nelson the year prior when Reggie Nelson got hurt, he made some plays. And we talked about improvement. He's a guy who has consistently improved, especially from a guy that we heard about when the Bengals drafted that never even really played past defense at Georgia. He was a guy that was like a run stopper only. He was almost a linebacker, like a Mark Barron or, right. you know, uh, so, you know, he, he has improved, especially against the pass. I don't think he will ever be a, a pro bowl safety, but he's still very young and he keeps improving. And I think, Next to Aloka, and if that defense stays healthy, he could he could be um, one of those guys. I you know I I I I see I see what you're saying there. Now I'm going to go with a guy that you mentioned, Cody, in terms of when we talked about your thoughts on the draft class. I and he's a late round pick. He he may have you know just special teams duty he may struggle to to find the find the team but i'm going to go a little risky and bold here and i'm going to say jordan evans the oklahoma linebacker he can cover he can run he needs work on tackling he needs work on uh you know being a little more physical shedding blocks but this guy's an athlete and he's a guy that he's a player that is kind of like an emmanuel lemur that that never really you know and and unfortunately he never really fully materialized into what Paul Gunther wanted. But the guy, I think he had four interceptions last year alone in college. I think two of them were returned for touchdowns. He, he just, he, he made some plays. The team doesn't seem to be enamored with PJ Dawson at this point. Uh, obviously they're going to give a bigger, bigger thing, a bigger role to Nick Vigil this year. So I don't know. I see, I see Jordan Evans maybe having, and Marquise Flowers has been a guy that's been hurt and, I, you know, I don't know if they're still enamored with him. So I wouldn't be surprised if Flowers gets cut. Uh, yeah, I, I I agree with you. And uh, you know, they're gonna have to go thin somewhere if all these other positions yep. are gonna go heavy. So why wouldn't you go thin at linebacker when you suspect Vontez like probably not gonna miss that many games? You suspect uh, Minter's gonna play games, and then you only need a couple backups in that sense. And then if guys get hurt, I mean. You think anyone's signing Marquise Flowers off the street? No. You can call him up if someone goes down and bring him back. Yep. Yep. That's it's yeah, very true. And I think I think the upside with Evans is is a little higher than, than yeah. some of the other guys that the Bengals currently have. Uh, I think he needs work, obviously. But that's a guy I just when I I kind of I knew who he was when they drafted him. I was familiar with him, but then I really looked at the tape. I looked at his stats and I I kind of was like, whoa, this guy can he can he do some, some things. athletes. Yeah, he's 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 he can do some things, and uh, I th I think he could surprise some people in camp. Right uh, as we kick that off soon, uh, Scott Neosi in the YouTube chat says Nick Nick Vigil is a breakout guy. He may be legit. Uh, great one. That's another great yeah, one. And he's, he's he's, good, yeah, I would think uh, too. If we want to go to the draft class, another guy I think uh, Josh Malone. Yep. If you go back and watch their tape. Uh, you know, Dobbs isn't a great quarterback, and there are a lot of times where he's like full speed in stride and has to come back, and it probably hurt his stats some. And he reminds me a lot of RIP Chris Henry, yep. number 15, yep. just like his build and how he plays. Um, he's not the same athlete that Chris Henry was coming out, but he's he does Chris a lot Henry of the Mike. same things that Chris Henry did. You know, he's he's lanky, he can get up the field, he's really fast, and he's great in the red zone. He's a guy that I could see – you know, maybe Ross misses some time or if, if LaFell misses some time or whatever. But you have to remember this year, the, the key to their offense is Pandora's offense, right? Move guys around, have situations. Last year, as soon as Jeremy Hill gets in, you know what's coming. Power run every time. Now you put Mixon in, they, you could power run with them or you could split him out. And now the defense is going to go, oh, man. We got Mixon here. We got Ross there. We got AJ Green on the other side. We got Eifert in the slot. Now, what? I mean, where are they going to find guys to cover? Because they're going to have a Mitch match. And Andy Dalton's probably best quality as a quarterback is pre snap reads, finding the guy who's going to have the best matchup and just sticking to it. And yep. that's what they've given him the opportunity to do. So, Andy Dalton uh, should have a good year, too, if he, if he plays like he has in the past. It all is going to revolve around that offensive line, though, right? We all yep. know that. Yep, and I, I liked Malone as well when they drafted him. Uh, we're, we're still taking questions. We're still listening 
to uh, reading all of our listener comments. So if you have a potential breakout player you would like to to know about, we we can do that not only on this episode but maybe another. If you are not joining us live, please do. Please make the effort if you can. We love to we love to talk with you. You can also talk with a bunch of other Bengals fans. There's a lot of discussion going on in the YouTube live chat right now. So uh, please join us, especially now that training camp, preseason, all that stuff is coming. We love to interact with you. Uh, if you can't join us live, though, you can download the show on YouTube, on iTunes, on SoundCloud. Our material is also on Cincy Jungle, so check check it out there. You can get in touch with the program on Twitter at Bengals OBI and via email the OB Insider at gmail.com. Guys, we've got two two quick things to get to before we get out of here. One is we we haven't done this for a little while, but it's it's the hater of the week. I think we can all agree that this is a little a little ridiculous, but especially since we've started looking again at the schedule and whatnot. Scott, I'd be interesting. I'd be interested to to hear your thoughts because I think you have the Bengals at what eleven or twelve wins. Is that is that what you had this year? Ooh, that's rich. Realistic. I think I wanted to go sixteen and zero, but I might have tempered it down a little bit. Okay, but I mean, it's, I, here's the thing with this season, and we've talked about this. This this season can go eight or nine, seven, eight, nine wins, or it could go that way. Exactly. I mean, it could go eleven, twelve, thirteen, depending on health, depending on how the young guys play, all of that. But USA Today Sports randomly put out their season predictions as training camp starts to open up, and they have the Bengals at 5-11 and 11 with just one more win than the Cleveland Browns. Uh, Scott, your thoughts on 5-11, and 11, potentially seven or eight wins lower than what you have them maybe predicted at? I think that's a very easy prediction to make because that's pretty much what they did last year. So it's basically saying – yeah, this is the record last year. I don't think they're any different, so I'm just going to give them the same record kind of mindset, which is a easy way to predict, but not a very, um, I don't know, in-depth one. For me, the reason I think why I was so bullish on them, and yeah, I, I think um, I might have said 10 or 12 wins in a previous podcast as a upside potential. And the reason for that is I looked at the 2015 team that was 10-2 and two before Dalton got hurt, and this team is essentially – the same team are better across the board. In theory, you know, Jake Elliott's better than Nugent. Uh, Mentor should be better than Malaluga. You now have Ross and Boyd at wide receiver. You have Billings, who you know, we're hoping is better than Pecco. You have Willis and Lawson, who in theory are probably better than MJ93 and Gilberry on the right side. You've added Joe Mixon, who is just this elite stud, you know, guy that should have been the top running back taken, as Cody alluded to. So other than, and this is one caveat, other than offensive line, <laughs> which is a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just that one little thing. Yeah, and Cody lives in Dallas. So I'm sure he knows what an offensive line. Yeah, is. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's only the that, only thing that caused the whole demise of the '90s was a terrible offensive line. But just yeah, that outside of that, thing. yeah. So you know that one. But we've seen. I mean, obviously, you know, a great quarterback like a, um, you know, Peyton Manning, a. a um, um, Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers, you know, there have been guys who have been able to do that. I'm not saying Dalton is in that category. I think he needs the line. I think he needs the weapons to be very successful. But if Fisher and Obwehi can be, you know, at least halfway as decent as uh, Alexander and Marvin Lewis constantly say they are, granted they've been saying that about Bodine for, you know, three four years, but if they can be halfway as decent as we expect that, Hey, these guys are at least league average NFL starters. I think they have a chance to be much better than that five and 11, because as I mentioned pretty much across the board at every other position, they're as good or better than that 10 and two team. So the only thing is, does, you know, Fisher and Abwehi, are they going to absolutely um, tank them? And are they going to have to be scrambling, trying to find who to put out there, you know, put a Trey Hopkins or slide someone else, you know, outside because these guys aren't working, you know, bring Winston back for his you know, 34th NFL season or whatever it is, you know, pull Munoz out of retirement, you know, hopefully we're not resorting to that. Hopefully those guys can do what, you know, the team drafted them to do. If that's the case, then I think this team's definitely better than five and 11, because as I said, you know, they, they are, they, they should be better than that team that finished 12 and two, even with um, AJ McCarron playing a few of those games at the end. Uh, yes, and and to me, I think if you really go five and eleven, 
literally every single thing that could go wrong would have to go wrong for the for this team to go five and eleven. Not saying it's absolutely impossible, but you're t- this is a team with a lot of talent. AJ Green, they they added. Ross, Mixon, Malone, Lawson, Willis. They've still got Dunlap. They've still got Geno Atkins. They're get, they, they've got Tyler Eifert. It, unless everybody gets hurt, and unless the offensive line is a complete disaster, and Andy Dalton completely regresses from the last two seasons that we've seen, Cody, I, I don't see five wins. I mean, I, I, there's just too much talent for five wins unless this team just gets absolutely decimated by injury. Yeah, so I don't have as much problem with the prediction of 5-11 and 11 as I do how they predicted the Browns to win four games and the Ravens to win seven or nine games. That Ravens roster is just – I mean, like, you look at that roster and you, you tell me – I mean, they signed Jeremy Macklin. Okay, he's their number one receiver now. Who else is there? Brashard Perriman, who you'll attest, Anthony, that uh, AC when I did when we did the live draft at Lachey's, as soon as they picked him, I said, you know, like this guy is fast, but he's not like a guy that's going to break the world. In and the, everyone just loves this Ravens team always, and it's like, dude, what's Flacco done without weapons? Nothing. And rookies, like, okay. And they have no weapons on offense. They just lost Kenneth Dixon. So now they, their running back is going to be probably Terrence West or whoever else is still there. Oh, Danny Woodhead. Yeah, okay. I mean, journeyman who was great in in San Diego, but just coming off an ACL. So I'm with you, though. Like, to get 5-11, and 11, Andy Dalton's got to go down early in this season, knock on wood. And to Scott's point, you know, the offensive line, ask a John Carter how a bad offensive line can ruin your career, knock on wood. Things have changed a lot in science and in medicine for them. But um, I think that for 5-11 and 11 to happen, Andy Dalton's got to get hurt in one of the first couple games, and, uh, and A.J. McCarron has to go out there and struggle because, like you said, there's just too much talent. They have a pretty easy uh, schedule this year because they were pool, you know, didn't play yeah. well last year. They're yeah. getting the third strength, the third best team in every division, uh, so that helps as well. Um, so easier schedule, more talent. It, it'd be hard to see them going five and eleven unless there was a litany of injuries to the team. Yeah. Um, the one one of the big beefs I do have with the team though is you see like guys like Willie Anderson going up to the Browns team and coaching their offensive line. Because he wants to, he said he doesn't want to be a coach, but he likes to help out. Like, isn't this team reaching out to their alumni? Like, you have two offensive tackles that will be the make or break, most likely, of your season. And a guy like Willie Anderson obviously wants to be coaching and helping out. And he's doing it with Hugh in Cleveland instead of in Cincinnati with the Bengals. And it just strikes me as like, what, do you, what are you thinking that you're not calling him up and saying, hey, man, we got two young tackles. You and Anthony Munoz come to practice every day and help these guys out because I'm sure Anthony Munoz would be there in a heartbeat, and Willie Anderson obviously would if he's going up to do the same thing in Cleveland. So um, I think it's hater. I think, it, I think it's national media, right? How much publicity does this team get? What was in the media for this team this offseason? That all their offensive line left in free agency. And there was no other coverage. The draft, you know, everyone says, oh, the draft, you know, good draft, bad draft, but you never know. Those guys don't make early impacts. The only news that the Bengals really got this offseason was negative in the national media. So they're going to see 5-11, and lost their two best offensive linemen, like Scott said. It's easy to just say 5-11. and Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 lazy reporting from the national media, to be quite honest, and that's kind of what status quo for a Bengals Bengals fan. You know, you always kind of <laughs> see until they win eight until they win eight and zero that one year, they've never been praised in the media, and then it's like then all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, this team's so good, they're gonna beat the Patriots, and then it's like, <sighs> yeah, yeah, well. Uh, I, I yeah, I mean, I I said my piece on it. A five and eleven's a little a little. 
hard to swallow. But uh, again, I think a lot of things would have to go differently and and have to go completely sideways. And and what would ensue after a five and eleven season in terms of personnel and everything would also be very interesting to see. But congratulations, USA Today Sports. You are this week's Orange and Black Insider Hater of the Week because you nominated the Bengals to go five and eleven. Well, your, your, your rewards in the mail. We'll send it to you. Guys, we, we <laughs> usually get to listener questions. We don't have enough time for it, but there is some discussion in the chat room. I, I've seen it. I've also seen the news since, and it's something I want to I talk about real quick before I get out of here because it is very pertinent on a number of different fronts. Joe Flacco apparently has a herniated disc that has just been discovered as they get set up for, for training camp. Cody, you mentioned that the Kenneth Dixon injury there that uh, they've already suffered and they've got some other things going on. But Joe Flacco, guys, might be out three to six weeks. Now, if he is at the end of that timetable, we're talking about the season opener being in jeopardy in terms of him starting against the Bengals in that season opener in Cincinnati. Now, Joe Flacco, the last couple of years, hasn't fared greatly against the Bengals, but obviously he gives them the best chance to win. Scott, what do you think this means not only for, number one, is this just kind of, well, they're putting it out there, and again, this could be a deal that, you know, middle of the preseason he could come back, or, you know, if he does miss that game, does this just signal a blowout in, in favor of the Bengals, or might the Ravens still kind of play tough without their starting quarterback? I guess I'd be surprised if it's a blowout just because the Bengals don't seem to be a blowout kind of team, especially this year. Not really knowing what we're going to get from them. I, I think it makes the game an easier game, obviously, depend, assuming uh, Flacco's not in and seeing who wins that backup spot for them. Um, I guess I'd have to look up and see who their backup quarterback is. But you would assume – Ryan Mallett, okay. I think, right? Isn't it Ryan Mallett? If it is, I don't know. I is Jimmy Clausen still on that team? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, probably not. Might be Dilfer. I'm not sure. Whoever they oh have, lord, whoever they have back. If it's a rookie, I'd be worried because the Bengals just have yeah. A- Ryan Ryan Mallett and Dustin Vaughn it, uh, is, okay. is what I'm saying. Jimmy yeah. Vaughn. Although, didn't we, we have it. We lose these guys like Thaddeus Lewis and Trevor Simeon that no one's ever heard of. And you're like, oh my god, yeah, they're going to crush them. So I don't want to say anything until we know who's playing and. Uh, but that being said, in theory, it should make it an easier game. And as obviously as Cody and you guys alluded to, Flacco's not exactly elite. Ah. Ah. But, yeah, so I, I'd say I, I, it should be an easier game. But I don't want to say that because we just have a bra- bad record at going up against these, uh, you know, TJ Yates and all these other kind of guys that really have no business beating a NFL team. Yeah, and in, in, in the – Later stages of Andy Dalton's career, the Bengals have had a fair share of success against the Ravens going head-to-head with them. And uh, at the end of 2015, when A.J. McCarron was starting for the team, I believe they beat Ryan Mallett and, and the Ravens handily at the, end of, uh, at the end of the season there as well. Cody, before we get out of here, just some, some final thoughts on the Joe Flacco news. Does it really affect the game quite a bit? Uh, if, if he does happen to be out for that season opener... Or can the Ravens still kind of play that ground and pound, nasty defense and keep it close type of game? Uh, I think it's a big, big blow to them. I think more of anything, it's another blow to their season. You know, a herniated disc is not something he's going to come back in six weeks and just be uh, – you expect that he's going to have an issue again as a quarterback. He's going to mm-hmm. take hits. I mean, think about Eifert. You know, his back was hurt. He was fine, ready to play, and then – goes out in warmups and then he's just done for the season, you know? So a back is, a, is a real tricky thing for football players, especially. And, uh, you know, I think this is a really bad sign for the Ravens season. Uh, and I think their season can really tailspin out of control quickly. They've lost a corner. They've lost a running back. Now, if they lose their quarterback, um, you know, five and 11 is not out of the question for that team with that roster, the schedule they're going to face. So, yeah, I think it's a big blow to their team. I, I mean, you're going to give me the choice of Joe Flacco or Ryan Mallett. I think we know who everyone's going to take 20 times out of 20. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, and I think Dennis Pitta, you mentioned him earlier. I think he has another issue that he, you know, he may not. He's done. Yeah, he might, he might. He's out. He's retiring. Yeah. He might, he might never play football again. So, uh, and sad deal for him. I mean, he seems like a decent dude. Yeah. Uh, just, just can't stay healthy. But uh, I think it obviously helps the Bengals chances. If he if led he, that if, team in receptions last year. Yeah. Yeah, he had a, he had a nice comeback here last year. I, obviously, this helps out the Bengals in Week One if Flacco can't go. Uh, you know, if you're if you're a Ravens fan listening to this podcast, welcome. But uh, I, you know, I don't know what to tell you at this point. You're you're kind of uh, reeling a little bit. Not saying the Flacco's out for the year, but who knows? As this thing progresses, it could be something that needs surgery. It could be something that. It, you know, uh, could could provide major setbacks, or it could be something that you know he's just not going to sit out the preseason and be ready for Week One. We'll see, but it does affect the Bengals big time with their first uh, game of the season and their their hosting of the Ravens at Paul Brown Stadium. Guys, we're going to get out of here. Scott, thanks for everything. Any final thoughts before uh, before we sign off, my friend? Yeah, I'm just uh, going to say I'm kind of excited. As soon as we hang up here, the other form of football, the CONCACAF Gold, Gold Cup is starting, I think, any minute. Okay. With the U.S. and – you get you didn't know that. I'm like, <laughs> U.S. and Jamaica playing in the finals tonight. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that so either. From, from, from one football to another. I like it. Okay. So tune in. If you are watching this live, tune in. Tune into that. The, tune into football, USA football. Uh, yeah. Thanks for everything, Scott. Uh, appreciate it. Always, always good chatting bangles with you, Cody. Thank you for making the time to come onto this program. Hopefully we make it a, uh, a more regular occurrence, my friend. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, I had a good time and, uh, I'm excited for training camp tomorrow. Uh, don't tell my employer. I probably won't get much done cause I'll be following <laughs> what's going on. Uh, yeah. and making sure I, let's just say, let's hope for no news from the Bengals organization for the next two weeks. Let's let's hope Tyler for no. Tyler or Vontez Burf 6 extension. I don't want to hear a tweet from Bengals.com. <laughs> okay. Is there only let's, bad tweets? In training let, camp, there are only bad tweets. So uh, I just hope that uh, we don't hear from the Bengals m- medical staff. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's what I don't hope for. I don't want to see any carts on the field. I don't want to see updates on all of a sudden someone looks good and then they rehab and things look poor. I, I just kind of don't want to hear from the medical staff uh, for a variety of different reasons. And hopefully this team stays healthy, has all of its, uh, you know, all of its guns blazing as the regular season starts. But, you know, there's preseason games to be played and a lot of practices to be had, which start uh, real soon. So enjoy Thanks for tuning in to the Orange and Black Insider. For Cody Toomey and Scott Schultze, I'm Anthony Cazenza. We will talk to you next episode.